BBC from Global, leading Britain's conversation, The Nigel Farage Show. Mr. Nigel Farage. Thank you, Donald, and good evening, everybody. Another horrific attack on the streets of London. Of course, this time it's the other way round, in the sense that it is somebody attacking a group of Muslim worshippers. Uh, I think it's an act that will only make things worse. Uh, it's an act that is designed to sow deep division in society, and it is awful. And we'll talk more about that uh, later on in the programme. The big, significant political story today is, and it's taken a year because it was the 23rd of June uh, 2016 that we voted for Brexit. It's taken a year uh, for us to get in gear, for us to trigger Article 50. Of course, there was a slight delay by something called the general election, uh, which uh, didn't necessarily go the way the Prime Minister had wanted it. But today, in Brussels, the official Brexit talks have begun, and of course it is David Davis, the Brexit Secretary, meeting Michel Barnier, who is the European Union's chief Brexit negotiator. He's a former French foreign minister. He uh, was a European commissioner. Uh, he's someone that I've known for many years, uh, always unfailingly plight, um, even to me. Believe it or not, he comes up in the tea room and says, good morning, how are you? Um, so I think of all the um, EU people, you know, far better that it's him than a Mr Juncker or a Mr Verhofstadt, who take a very, very aggressive attitude. That doesn't mean that Mr Barney is going to be anything like a pushover, but today's session has finished with a big press conference and Michel Barney is saying that negotiations have got off on the right foot he says that he and David Davis have agreed on dates, on organisation and on priorities. So what's going to happen is there's going to be a week of negotiations that take place every month and in between time uh, parties will work on the proposal. Now the first three points that the European Union wish to discuss with us are citizens' rights, finances, by which they mean the bill they're going to ask us to pay, and other issues such as, in particular, the Irish border, where the European Union is saying they want to make sure uh, that we maintain an open border with Ireland. Of course, we've had an open border with Ireland for nearly a 100 years, um, a point that seems perhaps to have passed some people by. And Barnier was, in some ways, reasonably optimistic. Um, he did say a fair deal is possible, and in his opinion, far better than no deal. Now, so the Barnier plan is to talk about these three issues in the early stage, and once that's all been agreed, this is the EU's line, then we would move on to talk about trade. So they are kind of setting this agenda. David Davis, in response, said that the talks were very constructive. He even went as far as to say that a deal is eminently achievable. So some very positive stuff from a David Davis who was looking... I thought pretty calm, pretty relaxed, uh, pretty in control. I'm sure some people tomorrow in the newspapers will say, um, in an attempt to make mischief, that he even looked quite prime ministerial. And I think you're going to see a lot more of that over the course of the next few weeks, given that the prime minister's position is seen by many to be weakened. Uh, but Davis uh, makes the point that, uh, you know, even though the EU appear to be setting the terms, uh, Davis says, what matters is how the talks end, not how they start. So, OK, what are the other big priorities beyond citizens' rights, beyond the bill we have to pay, beyond the Irish border? Well, of course, trade is one of them, a big one, uh, and some big pushback, particularly since the general election from the Labour Party. And I've seen today a string of Labour Party spokesmen saying actually what Britain should do is stay within the customs union. Uh, and remember, if we stay within the customs union, we won't be able to negotiate our own trade deals 
outside of it. But there seems to be, from Keir Starmer, uh, who is in charge of their EU policy downwards, there seems to be, despite the fact that in the general election, Corbyn was very clear that we would not be part of the single market, that free movement would end and Britain would be leaving. There seems to be now an awful lot of pressure coming from the Labour Party to change the, ter- to change the terms of this. And I think on the other side, uh, we've got a Conservative Party that now looks really very split indeed, uh, with even the chance of the Exchequer suggesting that perhaps we should remain within the customs union. So both parties have some problems on this issue. But what do you think should be the priority? Should it be the economy? Should it be immigration? Should it be something else? What should David Davis be trying to do in these negotiations? What should be top of the list? I'm going to ask Edward in St Albans as my first caller this evening. Edward, imagine yourself as David Davis. What is your priority? Hi, Nigel. Thanks for accepting my call. Um, I think that the focus should be on remaining in the single market and getting the best possible trade deal for the country. Well, hang on. If you you remain in the single market, you don't need to negotiate a trade deal because, effectively, we wouldn't have left the European Union at all, would we? Well, I feel that what we can do is that we need to focus on um, remaining in specifically the single market, but we we can change certain aspects to it. So... Single market membership has always meant one thing, but there's no reason why we can't walk in and say, we want to change this aspect, we want more control over immigration. You know, we're a great country, well, I think we will have a lot of influence. Well, Edward, uh, somebody tried this not long ago. His name was David Cameron. He went to renegotiate our relationship. He went to try and get controls on borders, etc., etc. And you know what he got, Edward? He got a flea in his ear and told it isn't going to happen. And surely, Edward, if you think, and clearly you do, that we should stay within the single market, isn't that, wouldn't that be willfully going against what the public voted for in that referendum? Well, I think, first of all, I would not trust David Cameron as our, as our main negotiator and as a good representative of us. But secondly, I'd say that, you know, there was nothing on the, on the voting paper that said we had to leave the single market. And I think we do need a bit of well, flexibility. It's well, about our future generation. Well, well Edward, um, I'd remind you that not only did David Cameron uh, fail to renegotiate our relationship, but Tony Blair, at the height of his power, absolutely, he just won his third general election and he took over the six months rotating presidency of the European Union. I know I was there. I heard the speech and he said he was going to completely renegotiate the common agricultural policy. And what did he do? He gave away billions of pounds of our rebate for no fundamental change at all. So I wouldn't be very optimistic about change. But back to your point about the ballot paper. Edward, I'm going to make this point to you. Every single leading player on both the Remain and the Leave side in that referendum, every single one of them said, if we vote to leave the European Union, we are leaving the single market. And those on the Remain side saw it as being a terrible thing, and those of us on the Leave side saw it as a good thing. So, Edward, I think it was clear we were voting to leave the single market. Well, um, if you're going to look at what both sides said, I saw a recent um, poll by the Electoral Commission that said, I believe, 52% of voters thought they were being misled by politicians on both sides. So I think if you look at what was said on both sides and what was said by campaigns such as the amount of money we get back to spend on the NHS, you can't purely base our policy off that. The vote, the pure vote on which um, people ticked was whether we were leaving the European Union. Well, While if, if we... on both sides said things, you know, that wasn't what we fundamentally voted on. That's just what No, but if said. we stayed in a single market, Edward, and we weren't able to reform it, we would keep free movement of people, we would keep the jurisdiction of the European Court, and we'd go on paying billions of pounds a year. Edward, I understand your point of view. You think the single market is good for us. Um, I have to tell you one thing David Davis will not do, And I'm pretty certain of this. Um, And I shared platforms with David Davis in the referendum campaign. And David Davis, I know, is absolutely clear we should not be part of the single market. Though I'm not sure that all the rest of the Cabinet agree with that position. Vincent, in in Bedford, what would your priority be, Vincent, if you were David Davis? Well, well, there's two things. Um, I heard an interview this morning with uh, the former (coughs) Conservative MP for Hitchin, and what he said was that the, um, the problem for Davis and everyone else is, is not the economics, but the politics. Mm-hmm. And that, that, that they're, not, they're not going to concede whatever anyone might think. They're not going to concede too much because that will then give the impression he'll just encourage everyone else to leave, basically. 
Yeah, I mean, I get that, Vincent. If, if Britain is seen to get a very good deal, yeah. uh, then Denmark will leave very, very quickly. I mean, they would be very high up on the list. And who knows, there might be a mass of countries that say, do you know what? We don't want to be part of this union. We just want a simple uh, trade deal and close cooperation. So I do get that, Vincent. So you think, despite the positive body language that we've seen this evening, that actually uh, Monsieur Barnier isn't going to give too much? On, on the issue of uh, citizens' rights, yep. the, the, the thing there is, well, where do you draw the line? I mean, for, it, for the next two years, people will, will still be coming, will still be, have free movement. So, so where do you draw? Do you draw the line before the referendum or the point after people voted to leave? You know, they, well, the, they talk about... Well, well no-one's been clear, Vincent, about this, have they? I mean, no, no one's been clear. I mean, you know, <clears throat> the British government could say the rules are changing in two months' time or whatever it is. At the moment, and it's worth reminding people, Vincent, we're a year on from voting to leave. We are still paying... Uh, you know, into this club, a net £30 million a day, and we still have free movement. And, and, and so nothing yet has actually changed at all, has it? No. No. Well, Vincent, you're pessimistic about this. So if David Davis can't get anything, if they're not prepared to budge because they want to keep their union together, what then, in your opinion, should David Davis do? Well, if in um, a year and a half from now there is no, they can't budge... Mm -hmm then I think we'll have to follow the line of Theresa May and, and then just go for the, um, for the hard breaks of the, the WTO. WTO rules. Yep, yeah. yep, yep. Well, there, it, there is no choice, really. Yeah, if they're not prepared to play ball, then I think you are probably right. Vincent, I thank you very much indeed. So what should David Davis's main priority be going forward with these Brexit negotiations? Call me now on 0345 6060 973. Right now you're listening to The Nigel Farage Show exclusively on LBC and it's 7.15. Nick Ferrari at breakfast on LBC. Straight to our reporter who is outside the mosque in Finsbury Park. Crowds of people were making their way out of a Muslim welfare house when a van turned up and swerved directly into the crowd of people. Feline joins me. Feline, I understand you you actually were hurt in this. Good morning. I just come up from White Shovel Hospital. They just discharged me now. London Mayor Sadiq Khan. How safe is London, Mr Mayor? But we are safe, whether it's victims of crime, homicides. We're a safe global uh, city. And one of the reasons uh, that we, we can be confident is our police service uh, and emergency services work incredibly hard to keep us safe. Nick Ferrari at breakfast every weekday morning from 7, only on LBC. With Hampton by Hilton, now open in Aberdeen. <laughs> Galliard presents brand new homes, all within 35 minutes of central London by train and tube. And all with Help to Buy, the government scheme that allows you to buy with just a 5% deposit. Buy now in Chelmsford from under £200,000. Slough from £230,000. Luton from under £150,000. Rickmansworth and Kings Langley from £235,000. And Hounslow from £260,000. We also fully furnish your home free of charge. Come to 63 to 81 High Street, Rickmansworth, WD3 1EQ, from 5pm on Friday the 23rd of June until 4pm on Sunday the 25th. Call 0203 770 6300 or visit galliardhomes.com. That's galliardhomes.com. Breakdown cover from the AA. We'll do whatever it takes to make sure your big wheels keep on turning. Our mechanics usually get you going again in 30 minutes. Breakdown cover from the AA. Because anything can happen. What if you could choose between eating breakfast al fresco or al bedo? What if you went back to that special place which reminds you why you got together in the first place? And what if your 392nd date was just as much fun as the first? A world of what if is waiting. European City Breaks now from just £119 per person for two nights, including return flights and hotel. Book now at BA.com. Limited availability. Selected dates and conditions apply. At all protected. Divorce. It threatens the things you've worked hard for in more ways than you can imagine. Your home, savings, pension, and most of all, your relationship with your children. Don't let divorce cost you any more than it has to. Cordell & Cordell is dedicated to helping men in matters relating to divorce. Call now 
on 0330 or visit cordellcordell.co.uk. Office in Central London. A partner men can count on. This is the sound of someone breaking into your business. It's that simple. And once they're in your systems, they can do real damage. Hiscox Cyber and Data Insurance for small businesses covers everything from extortion to data theft. Our team of IT specialists will recover lost data and prevent further damage wherever possible, so you can concentrate on connections in the real world. Hiscox Cyber and Data Insurance. Ever onwards. The Nigel Farage Show on LBC. It's taken a year. But the Brexit talks have start. Michelle Barnier and David Davis have been hard at it today, followed by a press conference. And I'm asking you, what do you think David Davis's priority in these negotiations should be on behalf of our country? But on a slightly different note, um, an EU bigwig today has sent out a missive and backed it up with a press release. And this is the gist of it. This is to staff and employees and people who work for the European Union. You are advised not to drink alcohol during this heat wave. That's right. The nanny state in Brussels knows no limits. We're told we can't even have a drink. Well, I responded on Twitter by saying that I'm going to be there on Thursday for the summit and I shall ignore their advice, as I always do. And I then thought, who else in Brussels quite likes a drink? Ah, I know. My friend, Jean-Claude Juncker, the President of the European Commission. So I've tweeted at him and I've said, Dear Jean-Claude, time for us to unite together against this ridiculous EU proposal to ban alcohol. Does post-summit Thursday evening work for you? So I'm waiting to see whether it's possible that there can be a political alliance between Jean-Claude Juncker and Nigel Farage. We'll have to wait and see. And as far as what David's priorities are, uh, well, you are giving us a lot of response here on social media. On text I get, Nigel, our borders should be the priority. That's Alison. Nigel, can you campaign to stay in the EU? If you do, I'll buy you a pint, says Jimmy. Yeah, not in Brussels, Jimmy. Don't get caught buying a pint in Brussels. They're not for that sort of thing anymore over there. David Davis should prioritise becoming Prime Minister. The key negotiator of such a big change needs to be leader of the country, says Ollie in Basingstoke. Well, I did say earlier that I thought some in tomorrow's newspapers would tease uh, and would try to stir up a bit of trouble in the Tory party by saying how prime ministerial he'd look today. Ollie, I have to say, I think that if David Davis was prime minister... We would have a Prime Minister who actually believed in Brexit, because this one doesn't. She was asked four times by Jeremy Paxman whether she now believed in it, and all she could mouth was that she would do the will of the people. And I'm pretty confident that if David Davis became Prime Minister, he would get rid of those senior Cabinet Ministers who were trying to sow dissent over this. So, I have to say, Ollie, I would really rather like to see David Davis as Prime Minister. And you know what? It just could happen. Steve says to me, we didn't vote to negotiate. We voted to leave. I get one here from Dr Ralph. Nigel, liars don't gain. Stop lying. No good for your health. You must, you surely, Dr Ralph, you can do better than that. There isn't really much logic to that at all. Top priority should be negotiating deals with other countries in preparation for crashing out with no deal. Leopards don't change their spots and the EU won't suddenly become reasonable. Um, anonymous. Well, do you know what? I agree with that in many, many ways. I think that running concurrently... With these negotiations, we should be getting ourselves to the point, to the verge of signing trade deals with other countries. And do please remember that there's a fella in the White House and a team around him of people who are very, very positive about this country and want to do a trade deal with us. Uh, And indeed, I was was at lunchtime with a group of Chinese billionaires, uh, people who are very keen to start investing serious money in this country, and they want some big positive messages about Britain's role in the world post-Brexit. So I agree with that. There's a lot we could be doing now, apart from at the negotiating table in Brussels. But I'm asking you, what should David Davis's priorities be? And I'm going to ask Richard in Glasgow. Richard, good evening. Hi, Nigel. How are you doing? I'm fine. So what are the priorities, Richard? Uh, well, I wasn't too sure about a hard Brexit and a soft Brexit, Nigel. Oh, right. I if, if a hard Brexit goes ahead, that means we can do a deal 
out with the EU immediately. Would that be fair? Uh, Richard, uh, during the referendum, the terms hard Brexit and soft Brexit were not used by anybody, all right? Yeah. It's only yeah. after the referendum, and when the establishment lost, what they tried to do was to redefine the debate. Soft Brexit, nice, cuddly, good, hard Brexit, bad, dangerous, extreme, awful. So hard Brexit is defined by these people as leaving the single market, as leaving yeah. the customs union, and as being, yeah. pre and as being prepared if necessary. And by the way, this isn't my priority. I think we should just have a, sens a sensible tariff-free trade deal. But it's being prepared to walk away. Um, and, and soft Brexit is code, Richard, for us staying in the European Union, apart from the name. So we'd leave the Treaty of Rome, but we'd stay in all the other bits. And I think it really is you know, a giant attempt by the establishment, Richard, to con us um, and yes, I'm with you. You know, uh, I, I mean, you know, these Chinese businessmen that I met today, uh, they were saying, well, we've been reading um, in the Financial Times and elsewhere uh, that if we don't, if, if Britain didn't have a trade deal, this would be disastrous for business. I said, guys, you have no trade deal with the European Union at all, and yet you managed to sell 300 billion euros worth of goods into the single market last year without being a member of it and without having a trade deal. So, Richard, I'd want us to have a deal, but if we don't, we'll be free to open ourselves up to the 85% of the world's economy that is not in the European Union. That was my next question, Nigel. I think uh, we've got close ties to Europe, but it's not the biggest market for our products. Well... Uh, I, as far as I know... Uh, America's a bigger marketplace in Europe than the rest of the well, well, actually, Richard, uh, let's just uh, you know get 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 this factually right. I mean, forty percent of our overseas trade is done with our next door neighbours in the European Union. So it is a significant, very significant part of our business. It's the biggest single part of our business. But here's the important thing, Richard. Two quick points. One is that every year that goes by, the percentage of business we do outside the EU is outstripping the the, the the growth of business with the EU. And secondly. You know, when we joined the European Club, it accounted for something like 30% of the global economy. It is now down towards 15% of the global economy. And in 15 years' time, that's projected to be less than 10%. I'm not saying trade with Europe isn't important. It is. But what I am saying is it's the rest of the world where the growth's going to be. So, Richard, which do you favour, a hard or soft Brexit? I would say a hard Brexit. And the reason I'm saying this, Nigel, is this. This is going to drag on for two years. Well, it after could. After two years, after two years, what's going to happen? They're going to have no trade deals with anybody else because you're not allowed to. Like you're still in the, well, in the European well, Union. Well, right? well, that's a moot point, Richard. That's a moot point. Uh, my lawyer's interpretation of the rules is that we're not allowed to sign a trade deal with anybody else. One or two officials in Brussels have told us we're not even allowed to negotiate a trade deal during that two-year period. And I think in a constructive spirit, what we should do is tell them to go to hell um, and, and we, we will obey the big part of the law about not signing, but we'll we, we get everything else in place. Richard, you favour a hard Brexit, but I'm not going to call it hard Brexit. I'm going to call it what we voted for, a proper Brexit. Jilly, in Battersea, what do you think Davis's priority ought to be? <laughs> Good evening, Nigel. Good evening. Um, first of all, I must say, I never ever said that I would ever call uh, your show and we'll be speaking to you because I voted um, to remain. Yep. And I was always for remain. Um, however, um, all of the talks of the hard and soft Brexit and what, it's soft, um, what the soft Brexit should be is a bit pointless and ridiculous now because if we wanted to leave yep. and we decided that we want to control our borders, we want to um, um, have uh, control of the, of the immigration and the whole lot, that, that's what we voted for. And we need to stand up and count the, the consequences and go for exactly for what we voted for. We can't possibly just go back and say, oh, actually, no, we, we, we wanted to leave, but actually, no, we wanted to stay. And, you know, we, we mm. wanted to be on our own. But actually, no, hang on a minute, but how about, you know, everything that we actually want to keep and... and, and, and so, Julie, so, so Julie, let just just get, just get your position absolutely clear. Are you telling me that you believe in democracy and in following the will of the people? 
Yes, I did. <laughs> well, great. I'm, I'm so yeah. pleased. I'm so pleased to hear it because I, I've been I've been listening today to Lord Mandelson and of course Nick Clegg, who's never going to go away. Um, and they're all telling us that somehow we voted for something different, and they want to not just obstruct; they actually want to overturn the vote, Gillian. I think it's appalling. Exactly, and you know, like if we if we don't go with what we voted for, then what have we achieved? We just crash the car and say. We clutched the property market, um, literally went through the year of uncertainty, and we're going to go into another two years of not knowing what the heck is going to happen. And now everybody's shouting, no, actually, we don't want it. So what, what, what have we wanted for, and what was the point of it all? Well, if yeah. we don't want to take what we voted for and, uh, and, and accept the consequences and, and basically, you know, and, and, and go with that... For it's richer, for richer or poorer, for richer or poorer, we made a decision. Exactly. And, exactly. and your point about the currency, sterling's been falling since 2010 and quite rapidly since 2014, way before Brexit was even talked about. Jilly, love the phone call, love the sentiment. John in Newcastle, what should the priority be? The priority should be, Nigel, Brexit. Yep. No hard, no soft Brexit. Just a I full, know, a full English bre- <laughs> Brexit, John. Is that right? I, I, you know, I really don't understand these politicians who, who, who obviously have something to lose, and they want a, a soft Brexit. There's no such thing. We need to get out. I'm a 59 year old man who grew up in the northeast of England, and it was full of employment. Mm-hmm. When we're saying that, when we're saying that agreement in 1974, the shipyards died, the died, the mines died, the steelworks died, everything died. Do you feel, what? John? Do you feel, do you feel optimistic that if Brexit is delivered, I, I, that, that we're going to have a better future? I feel seriously optimistic because I think we can trade with anybody in the world, and I don't give a flying fart if anybody <laughs> says to me that you know we can't deal. Listen, if people want to, if people want to trade with us, they'll trade with us. John, I tell you what, I'm going to back up your point by saying this: governments don't create. Business. It's a myth. Business is created because a consumer looks at a good, looks at a service and says, do you know what? I trust that product. I like the right price you know, and I'm going to buy it. And that, John, is how business happens. I'm not sure most of our career politicians understand it. I thank you, John, in Newcastle for your call. You're listening to The Nigel Farage Show, exclusively on LBC. It's 7.30 and time for the news with Moira Alderson. Police are searching a home in Cardiff in connection with a terror attack in North London last night that's left one man dead and ten other people injured. A 47-year-old man arrested on suspicion of terror offences and murder has been named as a father of four, Darren Osborne from Cardiff. Police say they now believe 79 people were killed in the Grenfell Tower fire. Only five victims have been formally identified so far. The rest are missing, presumed dead. The Brexit secretary says the opening day of negotiations about us leaving the EU has been productive. David Davis says it's clear both the UK and the EU want to achieve the best possible outcome. LBC weather, a sunny and warm evening ahead for much of the country, staying dry overnight, feeling very warm and muggy in the south of the country with lows of 20 degrees. LBC Travel. Good evening. I'm Andy Lake. Starting off in North London, Seven Sisters Road in Finsbury Park stays shut either side of Finsbury Park Station for the ongoing police investigation. Into Essex, queues on the M25 clockwise between 26 for Waltham Abbey and 28 for the A12. A lorry's broken down and closed the inside lane. In Hertfordshire, it's slow on the northbound A1 heading out of the capital between Boreham Wood and the M25. That's after a collision which has left just one lane open. Lots of issues on the rails. They will start off on the tubes. The Circle, Hammersmith and City District Central and Jubilee lines are all delayed tonight. The Circle and Hammersmith and City lines are also suspended between Wood Lane and Edgware Road. Great Western Railway have delays of around 45 minutes in and out of Paddington, whilst Heathrow Express are running a reduced half-hourly service. And Greater Anglia have delays of up to an hour to and from Liverpool Street via Shenfield. For more real-time traffic updates, go to lbc.co.uk. This is LBC. Pets, we positively love them. So for those times they're feeling rough, get pet insurance from Pets in a Pickle. Go to petsinapickle.co.uk. When you hear a PPI commercial like this, you think, I wonder if I ever did have PPI. And maybe I should claim with the deadline being announced. And then you think, oh, but I'm not sure where my paperwork is. So you end up doing nothing. 
Well, here's the easiest thing in the world to do. Just text the word EASY to 60777 and the Claims Guys will conduct a free search to discover if you ever had PPI and then you can decide to pursue the claim yourself or get the Claims Guys to do it for you. Text EASY to 60777 now. The Claims Guys. West Wales. Expressive, energizing, agile. With its daring design, sleek exterior, intelligent features and impeccable driving characteristics, the all-new Nissan Micra offers you a driving experience like nothing in its class. The high specker center model is now available with a £1,950 deposit contribution. Only 199 deposit and low monthly payments. Representative 4.99% APR. Subject to status, so find your nearest Westway. Westway Nissan today. Moving house, nightmare. I need a plasterer, plumber, electrician, builder, painter, locksmith, gardener, and somebody to move my valuables, the drinks trolley. Relax, relax. It's Trust a Trader. They have all the tradespeople you can think of, reputable and reviewed, so you always get a job well done. Well done me, I say, for getting it all sorted. I shall reward myself with a cheeky tipple from the trolley. Chin, chin, pass me the gin. <laughs> Visit trustatrader.com. Trust a Trader. The FCA has introduced a deadline to permanently end claims for missold PPI. When this passes, you could miss out. And with billions of pounds still to be repaid, some of that money could be yours. So call now and speak to Claim for Refunds. We have helped thousands win millions since 2009 and we could help you too. All we need is the name of your bank. So if you've had any loan or credit card, let Claim for Refunds find out for free if you had PPI. And if you have, you can claim yourself, or we can handle it for you. It's up to you. And if we don't win your money back, you don't pay a penny, guaranteed. You could be owed thousands and not even know you have PPI. Call 0800 180 8180 or text PPI to 88882. The Nigel Farage Show on LBC. Call 0345 6060 973. Well, lots of different ideas and thoughts about what David Davis's priorities should be in this renegotiation that after a year of waiting has finally started. But, of course, uh, the news, certainly for the first half of the day, completely dominated uh, by the events that took place just after midnight or so last night um, when a man in a hard van deliberately and willfully ran into a group of people, a group of Muslims who'd come out of the mosque after late-night prayers. Some talk this morning, uh, I heard that the media weren't covering this in the same way as they covered the Westminster Bridge attack or the London Bridge attack. Uh, some criticism that the media were referring this, to this as an incident as opposed to using the term terrorism. Uh, I think that's all nonsense. I, th I think the media have treated this in exactly the same way as they treated the other attacks. Uh, and indeed, uh, the Prime Minister um, couldn't have been clearer in her total condemnation of it, as with everybody else. What fascinates me is that some have, have approached this in a way that I find very surprising. The sainted J.K. Rowling, who was a prolific uh, tweeter and has a massive Twitter following, and after all the other uh, terrorist attacks that have happened in our country, um, she has, uh, you know, said that our country will stand up and, and, and we will, you know, we will, we will get through this, and she obviously criticised Donald Trump, um, but nowhere did she seek to blame anybody for the radicalisation that had happened. She didn't blame the prison service for the London Bridge attacker being radicalised. She didn't bra blame um, any extreme clerics or any uh, appalling uh, videos on the internet. And yet today, oh, she knows, who's, she knows who's guilty for today. No worries about that at all. No, J.K. Rowling today says, let's talk about how the Finsbury Park terrorist was radicalised. And she does that by putting out a picture of me um, and my tweet on it and a picture of the breaking point picture of the huge queues of people trying to get into Europe last year as part of the Merkel madness. Uh, Julia Hartley Brewer defended me by saying, yeah, I was waiting for this. Elected politicians calling for limits on immigration are now responsible for inciting terrorism, are they? And I have to say uh, to J.K. Rowling, look, you may really dislike me. You may hold a huge prejudice against me. Uh, but if you've ever listened to this show, uh, you'll know that I've been one of the voices all through the course of the last 10 or 11 weeks uh, where I've been saying the last thing, the absolute last thing we want to do is to have a war against Islam. It would be a catastrophe. 
And I've also been a voice saying that I don't think we should round up the 3,500 terrorist suspects and put them all in prison, because I think that actually would radicalise a lot more moderate people, just indeed as it did in Northern Ireland when we interned large numbers of the IRA. So I'm sorry, J.K. Rowling, but you're speaking here out of pure prejudice and, I think, ignorance. But 0345 60 60 973 is the number, and I would love to hear from you. Now, back to this question of what should David Davis's priorities be, and Joe in London says to me, his message to David Davis is, walk away, give them nothing, zilch, we weren't misled, we're not stupid. Fair enough. Um, well, and the recommendation here from Claire on Twitter is that David Davis should get rid of all the rubbish, starting with you, Nigel. Isn't it interesting? Isn't it fascinating that on the other side of this, nobody seems to be able to engage with me without simply being abusive. All you've got to do is ring up, and I'll always give you your chance to have your say, and if you make your point well, I'll even tell you you've made your point well. You know, I believe in the things I believe in, but the point of this show is not for me to try and indoctrinate you. The point of the show is for all of you, on all sides of this, to have a proper debate. Rick on Facebook says, I did not vote for a soft Brexit. I voted to leave everything, says Rick. And Gary says, a clean, uncomplicated Brexit should be the priority. No single market, no customs union, no free movement, no half measures, just completely out. I thought, Gary, that's what we voted for. I really did. Tony, in Cardiff, what would your priority be in these negotiations? Well, first of all, Nigel, I'd like to say that I totally, 100% disagree with you yep. on everything that you've stood for. But as a person, I quite like you. Uh, I think you're a character, and, and I like characters, so I certainly very kind be of abusive you. to you. Right, good. Um, well, well, I'm a business guy. Tony, 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 as I was just saying, you know, I, I mean, people like you that come on with a completely different view, that is the whole point of the programme, isn't it? It's yeah. so that we can hear all sides of the argument, and the people listening at home or in their cars, Tony, can then make their own minds up. So, That's you right. know, Tony, That's... you know, you're on LBC, the floor is yours. Absolutely correct. Look, I, I worked as um, an international sales and marketing director. I've been in business, as, as you have, for a, a long, long time. But these days I run my own company. But I used to work for some big English companies involved with export as well as Welsh companies. And the, the thing that frightens me about what you've been advocating, particularly as a businessman, is this. When I first worked in international markets, in the first day ever, I was in a factory in South Wales talking to people. We made manufactured commercial fitness equipment for gyms and hotels and what have you, mm -hmm. and the military. And on the second day, we travelled to America, and on the third day, I was in Phoenix, Arizona, in the world's biggest exhibition of fitness equipment. And when he walked in there, there was me and my colleague, uh, the chief exec. He went his way, I went my way, to do a market audit on this global market. And you go in there, Nigel, there was, and you know this yourself, you go in there, there was hundreds of companies all making something cheaper or similar or they had better brands, mm -hmm. they were you know, cheaper, better. And then I spent the next six years, well, the next year I travelled the world, completed my market audit. Then I put a strategy in place to grow this business that was called PowerSport International Limited. And it was difficult to say where on earth around the world does this business fit in. There was people by the dozen manufacturers, cheaper, all the Asian markets, and yeah. better. There was people in Europe with stronger brands, 20 times the size of us. There was American companies, 20 times the size. So my question to you is this, Nigel, right? Simple question. Yeah. How on earth are we going to succeed abroad when we struggle to make anything of our own and compete in the UK. Those manufacturers well, well, are well, 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 in indigenous market. Well, Tony, hang on a second. Hang on a second. We're doing pretty well with motor cars these days. We're doing very well with motor cars. We're making motor cars. Oh, sure, the money, the investment has come from overseas companies, but we are now making, we're manufacturing more motor cars in this country than we've ever done per annum. 
and we've got a very healthy export market going. And Tony, interestingly, two years ago for the first time, the number of cars we sell outside the European Union has exceeded the number of cars we're selling to the European Union. So there are things we're making and selling. Obviously, Tony, services, invisibles, as they've always been called, is something traditionally that we've been very good at. Uh, But I would make this point, Tony. I feel that outside of the EU single market, we'll be free to get rid of some of the excessive regulation. And I think that's how we get British manufacturing to being back and being competitive and with cheaper energy. But I disagree with it. And the reason I say this is this. Everybody knows an export pound for a dollar. They'll make something for a dollar that we will in a pound, and yet we need more dollars to equal what they've got. And then we've got to transport that those goods from the UK over to America. Then we'll pay customs to go inside. How on earth is a little country like Britain with a small indigenous well, market well, well, hang on, going Tony. to compete with the hang Americans on, Tony. in their backyard? We're, we're not gonna, Let me finish. We're, hang on, we're not going to pay tariffs in America because Donald Trump wants to have a trade deal with us. Yeah, but of course he wants to have a trade deal with us because he knows he's going to beat us hands down. Tony, given that you see all of this in a very problematic way, are you suggesting that we that in this difficult world that we're somehow safer inside the European Union. Is, 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 is that the point you're making to me? Uh, no, the point I'm making you, Nigel, is this, right? I think, you know what I know as business people, you mm-hmm. don't gamble the customers that you've got. You're gambling Europe for maybe around the rest of the world. And I just don't see where that glass is half full around the rest right. of the world. All right, OK. <laughs> well, t- 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 Tony, you've made your point. I would respond to you by saying that we're going to go on doing business with Europe, absolutely no problem at all. But I think we... Okay, even if you're right, let's just say you were right, and if we were gambling, then we're gambling business with 15% of global GDP against the potential of 85%. Tony, I thank you for your call. I understand, you know, none of this is easy, uh, but (laughs) I do think there's a bigger world outside the European Union. Um, I like this one. Alfie says to me, Nigel, hang on. Who cares what any of the MPs want in any party? It's the people that voted out, and our MPs shouldn't forget it. They work for us, not the other way round. Hear, hear, Alfie. Right now, you're listening to The Nigel Farage Show, exclusively on LBC, and it's 7.45. Coming up at 8 on LBC, Clive Bull. At the end of day one of the Brexit negotiations... Both sides say they're determined and optimistic. Do you feel the same way? Clive Bull on LBC. A wise man once said, if you do nothing, you'll get nothing. And that's especially true when it comes to making a PPI claim, particularly now the deadline for claims has been announced. So do something. Text EASY to 60777 and then let the claims guys do their thing. A free search to discover if you ever had PPI. What have you got to lose? One thing's for certain, if you do nothing, you'll get nothing. So text EASY to 60777 now and let the claims guys do the rest. The Claims Guys. Moving house, night, mare. I need a plasterer, plumber, electrician, builder, painter, locksmith, gardener and somebody to move my valuables, the drinks trolley. Relax, relax. It's Trust a Trader. They have all the tradespeople you can think of, reputable and reviewed, so you always get a job well done. Well done me, I say, for getting it all sorted. I shall reward myself with a cheeky tipple from the trolley. Chin chin, pass me the gin. <laughs> Visit trustatrader.com. Trust a Trader. History is made at Lords. Durham are the champions. It's Stuart Broad, it's Nottinghamshire. The Royal London One Day Cup final takes place at the home of cricket on Saturday, the 1st of July. Gone! It's the glorious Gloucester at Lords, and they've won it. Amazing scenes. Experience the drama of a cup final at Lords with tickets available from just £30. Search Lord's Final to find out more. This is the sound of someone breaking into your business. It's that simple. And once they're in your systems, they can do real damage. Hiscock Cyber and Data Insurance for small businesses covers everything from extortion to data theft. Our team of IT specialists will recover lost data and prevent further damage wherever possible, so you can concentrate on connections in the real world. Hiscock Cyber and Data Insurance. Ever onwards. 
The FCA has introduced a deadline to permanently end claims for missold PPI. When this passes, you could miss out. And with billions of pounds still to be repaid, some of that money could be yours. So call now and speak to Claim for Refunds. We have helped thousands win millions since 2009 and we could help you too. All we need is the name of your bank. So if you've had any loan or credit card, let Claim for Refunds find out for free if you had PPI. And if you have, you can claim yourself, or we can handle it for you. It's up to you. And if we don't win your money back, you don't pay a penny, guaranteed. You could be owed thousands and not even know you have PPI. Call 0800 180 8180 or text PPI to 88882. The Nigel Farage Show on LBC. Call 0345 6060 well, our last caller, Tony in Wales, was, was, was looking at all of this in a very pessimistic way. Um, Tony, David Davis said something today really rather uplifting. Um, asked about the difficulties of these talks, um, he used a very famous Churchill quote, and it was this. He says, the pessimistic seems dif- sees difficulty in every opportunity. The optimist sees possibility in every difficulty. And that is the Davis mantra going into this. And uh, Tony, doing business anywhere in the world is not easy. You've got to have the right product. You've got to have the right approach to sales. Uh, But actually, I think we're very, very well placed. Russ in Bromley, what will the deal be? What should the deal be that David Davis carves out in Brussels, if any? Uh, Well, I just have... um an issue with uh, not remaining in a single market because uh, I believe I'm an American. I live in the UK. I'm also a British citizen. And for me, it's a really important uh, remaining in the single market would be really important as deciding whether I want to go back to the US or stay in the UK. And I think because of that, I think lots of other people, lots of people who provide high skills and labor to companies and uh, the market in the UK will also be facing a similar conundrum and may decide to go either back to commonwealth nation or into the back into the eu or to the u.s like myself russ we're just about with brexit to open ourselves up to the commonwealth we betrayed them horribly 40 years ago by joining the common market but we're about to open ourselves up to them again and indeed and and i was i mean you you know you're an american i was with on fry on friday night um i was in south carolina uh, sorry north carolina with a group of business people uh, many of whom were genuinely excited that if we remove some of the regulatory barriers, that actually trade between the US and the UK could grow to the benefit of both. Mm, mm. Oh, absolutely. I, I'm hopeful that will happen as well. I really yeah. want that to happen. And I actually, I voted for UKIP in 2013, not to do with the actual economics of it, but because of the sovereignty issue of the EU having yeah. uh, uh, potential. Anyway, that's the point here is I don't think Trump will actually uh, be so enthusiastic to... Uh, uh, to strike up a trade deal with uh, the UK because of um, uh, his America First policy, I think he's a protectionist. He studied economics; he knows what, what you know, economic theory. Lay, you know, he doesn't want to uh, uh, see the UK and the US uh, uh, benefit from something like comparative advantage because him it doesn't exist. Well, um, well, so, Russ, well, Russ. I mean, look, you know, he is against what he sees as unfair competition, and he made that point, you know, all the way through the campaign and in all of the rallies. And, and you're absolutely right about that. Um, but that doesn't mean he isn't open uh, to trade with some countries, and he sees us as being, you know, pretty much equivalent in many, many ways. I think so. I think, um, obviously, his mother, my mother is British. His mother is British. Well, she was Scottish. My mother is English. So I understand how he could feel national, a, a natural affinity for um, the UK in that respect. And I do think there is lots of that playing into his kind of thinking about whether to strike up a deal maybe with the UK. But I also think if things get really politically heavy for him, his base will want him to kind of retreat back into the US, not to expand outward even to the UK. Mm. Um, I lived there. I used to actually, I live in Texas in America, so I know lots of, my, lots of my family members are Trump supporters, and I can speak with certainty when I say that that is something they will not care. I mean, even they don't really care about the fact that I'm over here in terms of uh, um, future, you know, uh, to them it's, 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 just, uh, it's just another place altogether, socialist world. So uh, that's <laughs> right. so basically I don't really, <laughs> A lot of Americans um, do think that. Russ, tell me, just let, let me just ask you finally, do you yeah. think David Davis will be able to cut a good deal? Yes, I do. You do. I think Theresa, I think Theresa May is hopeless. Uh, I voted for Jeremy Corbyn because I liked his policies. 
Wow. Um, but uh, yeah, David Davis, I would I voted for Cameron in 2015. Yeah. Um, stay in the EU. I'm a Cameron conservative, but not a May conservative. I like Jeremy Corbyn. I guess I vote for personality because I'm still thinking about the presidential system as it was in America. And what do you I think? Guess, what do you think, Russ? What, I mean, what is your view yeah. on David Davis's personality and how he's handled today? Uh, I think he comes across as an earnest, earnest uh, honest, trustworthy person. Uh, I think lots of people like to talk about how he wants a comprehensive school and all that stuff, so he comes across much more, um, much more likable, I guess. Uh, I think that was, you said about personality on election mm, night. I did, um, I did. TV. On ITV, I think it was. I don't remember exactly what it was, but yeah, it was. Uh, well, what I, I said I, was, yeah. what I said was that mm. Theresa May had completely bombed in the election. She'd come across. I, mean, I was taking policy out of it. I was just purely dealing with personality. That she was cold, robotic, and looked thoroughly insincere. Whereas Jeremy Corbyn mm. looked warm, humorous, addressed a crowd of ten thousand people in Gateshead, and he looked yeah. like he was having the time yeah. of his life. So, so yeah. let's let's just suppose, <clears throat> Russ. Let's just play a little game here because you like to vote. Mm -hmm. Being, you know, having been brought up as an American, you view this, vote, yeah. you view this in a presidential way. So, Russ, you're up against the wall. I'm asking you, Corbyn or Davis, which one would you vote for? Uh, I, I, I think I'd vote for Corbyn, um, well. but I think, I think it's a. Um... Uh, it's a lot more. I don't like that hypothetical, really. I don't okay, I, what, okay. What well, I, look, I was having a bit of, I was having a bit of fun with you. Yeah, Russ, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I would vote for Corbyn at the moment, but um, yeah. I mean, you know, it's, it's maybe not. Who knows? You know. Okay, uh, Russ, I've got, I've got to move on. I thank you for your call. Yeah. Um, and I no get, problem. I, I get on text. David Davis might as well take Corbyn with him to help fix a deal because at the end of the day, he and Labour will decide what is acceptable, says Brian. Well, I have to say, since the general election, I'm becoming quite worried about the arithmetic that is there in Parliament. Joe in London says, we'll do business with anyone, but we don't want them living here. Well, it's a bit hard line, Joe. I think, you know, so, <laughs> what we're talking about is control of immigration, control of our borders, not pulling up the drawbridge completely. The next PM, it's funny, isn't it? This debate has moved on very much this evening to who the next Prime Minister should be. It could still, of course, be Mrs May in 2022. The next Prime Minister should be David Davis. If Boris Johnson is chosen, the Conservatives will not win the election, says Lily and Bolton. Well, Lily, I think the truth of it is that Boris Johnson may not be as popular in the north of England, but he's very, very popular in London and the home counties. And indeed, you know, to, to, to have won as London Mayor in London for the Conservatives said to me that he had to have quite a bit of a personal vote. Um, Anne, in Motherwell, in North Lanarkshire, what should David Davis be doing? Hello, Nigel. Excuse me, I'm a bit nervous. Don't be uh, Anne, don't be <laughs> Just imagine you're having a conversation with a friend. <laughs> OK. I think he should get out now, because I don't think he should waste two years. He's not going to get a deal for those pompous, arrogant old men who are full of their own importance. <laughs> You'll be watching my speeches. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Nigel, I don't recognise this country. I'm of your age now. And in 1974, I was on 26 when we voted for the common market. Yeah. I don't recognise it. With 4, 4 million Muslims, 3.2 million Europeans, I just don't recognise it anymore. And I think we should control immigration. That's my main, main objective. So that is your, that is your burning priority. So, so if David Davis can't get a very quick deal on border controls, you would simply walk away, Anne, yeah? I think you should walk away anyway, whether he gets a deal around the Now, you're a, that, I tell you what, I, I said earlier that hard Brexit and soft Brexit were inventions, but I think, Anne, you do qualify as being a hard Brexit. It's just, just to hell with them, let's go, yeah? Well, look at David Cameron over there and negotiated for immigration, what have you. He walked away with his tail between his legs and got nothing. Well, actually, Anne, he was humiliated. He was. And, yeah. and I felt we as a country were slightly humiliated by that process. Yes, we were. We no. definitely were. No, absolutely. Have another suggestion, Nigel. And yeah. I think you might go for this one. Go on. <laughs> Why don't the 27 or 28 countries demand an audit of the EU? That way we will know exactly what we owe in the exit bill. And I think it will also create the downfall of the Europe European Union. Well, and they've been struggling for 20 years now to get uh, the accountants to really sign off their books. Um, I, uh, if you ask for something like an audit in Brussels, I don't think, Anne, you're going to get very far. They don't want to listen. And I thank you. And my last caller of the evening is going to be Chris in Isleworth. Chris, you're David Davis. What's your strategy? My strategy for David Davis is to pray. 
to pray. Yes, because <laughs> right. Britain has gone down. You you laughed at Tony Blair what he sort of did, but at least when Tony Blair was in power, we're about third, fourth richest. We've dropped down to the eighth. Mm -hmm. We are not so good. And uh, well, well, I'm your Trump friend. He, we were supposed to be above. Angela Merkel, and now he, he, she's gone ahead of us. Forget it. Trade, Forget yeah. it. Don't believe Forget a it. don't believe oh, a word yeah. of that baloney. Yeah. We believe Donald. Baloney. <laughs> Listen, Donald. I know the people around Trump very well. I know their instincts. I, you know, I have spoken to them not all that long ago, shall we say? Mm. And they are positive about a relationship with this country. But you know, so so you think David Davis sh should pray? Is that because you don't think Chris he's capable of getting a good deal? Look, Theresa May went, she went in all bullish that she's going to no Brexit. Is not, and now the whole party is saying, oh, no deal is, is, is going to be a bad mm. thing. And she thinks it is total chaos. Chris in Isleworth, thank you. Chris thinks it's total chaos. And the only strategy that David Davis can adopt is to pray. Well, I'm going to say this as my final thought. I think David Davis's priority is not to give in to Barnier's agenda. Because Barnier wants to agree all of this package before we even begin to talk about a trade deal. And I think we can't afford to do that. I think we need to talk about all the moving parts of this deal simultaneously, including trade. Because if we sign up to a financial settlement and many other things before we turn to any sort of trade deal, we could end up absolutely getting stuffed, which is not where I want us to be. You've been listening to The Nigel Farage Show here on LBC. I'm back tomorrow evening from 7. Coming up at 10, it's Ian Collins, but up next, it's Clive Bull. Nigel, thank you. At 9, it's the Consumer Hour. I'm joined by Dean Dunham to talk about your consumer...